In this video, we're going to review electronegativity, polar bonds, and ionic bonds. This picture from your book shows electronegativity values for the whole periodic table. You can see that red means high electronegativity, so our most electronegative atom is fluorine, and you can see that yellow means low electronegativity, so over here on this end, we have our low electronegativity. So the overall trend would be up and to the right. Obviously there are a couple of things that don't quite fit this pattern, like your noble gases over here, and you'll see that hydrogen's a little bit off in terms of electronegativity, but that's the general trend that we're going to follow. No, you do not have to memorize these values. As long as you know the trend, you'll be just fine. So how does electronegativity affect bonding? A polar covalent bond is a covalent bond where the atoms have a significant difference in electronegativity. Now remember that our covalent bond was when we were having electrons shared. So if you have something like hydrogen and hydrogen, that would be a nonpolar covalent bond. A carbon-carbon bond is also considered to be a nonpolar covalent bond. Now you can see that there are some differences in electronegativity that could potentially be polar covalent we're looking for this difference of 0.5 to 1.7. Let's check out a carbon-oxygen bond, for example. Oxygen has electronegativity value of 3.44. Carbon has electronegativity value of 2.55. If I'm doing my math correctly, that should give us a difference of 0.89, which falls in this range. So a carbon-oxygen bond would be considered to be polar covalent. Let's look at one more. How about a carbon-hydrogen bond? Carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.55. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.20. So they have a difference of 0.35. What you'll notice is actually below this range here. So that means that a carbon-hydrogen bond is actually not considered to be polar covalent. It is technically a nonpolar covalent bond because there's not a huge difference in electronegativity. Although keep in mind there is a small difference and this will come into play later. What happens when we go above 1.7? Let's look at one of those. So let's do sodium chloride. Fluorine has an electronegativity value of 3.16. Sodium has an electronegativity value of 0.93 and that will give us a value of 2.23. So you can see that that's well above this range, and what that means is that's not a polar covalent bond, that's actually an ionic bond. Bonds with differences below 0.5 will be considered nonpolar covalent, and bonds with differences above 1.7 will be considered to be ionic. Again, remember I told you you didn't have to memorize these values, so I would probably just memorize a couple of common bonds that you'll see a lot in organic chemistry, and then you don't have to go back and calculate it every time. So what we just calculated is the bond dipole, or the difference in polarity across a bond. So if you have a bond between two different atoms, and they're the same, you wouldn't have any difference of polarity. But if they're different, you will have at least a little bit of a difference in polarity. Here are a few examples. You can see hydrogen over here with an electronegativity value of 2.20, fluorine over here with an electronegativity value of 3.98. The more electronegative atom is fluorine, so we can represent this bond dipole by drawing the arrow pointing towards the more electronegative atom. And then the plus end is the less electronegative atom. If you don't like the arrows, you can also use the delta plus and the delta minus. The delta minus meaning that there's a negative charge buildup, or you have a more electronegative atom, and the delta plus meaning a positive charge buildup or a less electronegative atom. And we'll use both of these systems at different times in organic chemistry. Okay, let's look at methane, CH4. And remember I said that that carbon-hydrogen bond wasn't considered to be polar covalent. So notice that we're using this little small arrow to show a very slight difference in polarity. It's not significant enough to be a polar covalent bond, but we are just showing the direction of the polarity across that bond. 
Here's one last example. With carbon dioxide, you can see that we're looking at the difference between the carbon-oxygen bond. So we have one arrow going to the right and one arrow going to the left for the other carbon-oxygen bond in the other direction. These are some examples of electrostatic potential maps. What electrostatic potential maps show us is how the overall charge is represented in the molecule. So if we're looking at these pictures, you can see that any red represents a buildup of negative charge or a delta minus, and the blue represents a buildup of positive charge or a delta plus, and then you've got that coloring in between. So something like HF, remember the fluorine is the negative end, so it corresponds to the red over here. Hydrogen is the positive end, so it corresponds to this end over here. Now here's methane, and you can see the hydrogens here with the delta plus kind of correspond to these greener areas, the more positive buildup. And then the carbon is somewhere in there in the middle. You'll see also that this is starting to reflect the geometry of methane, which isn't going to be flat like this. Remember that this molecule is going to take on a tetrahedral shape. Over here with carbon dioxide, you can see the oxygens on either end corresponding to the red and the carbon in the middle corresponding to the blue. Here's BH3. The boron is the positive buildup in the middle, and you have the hydrogens that are in this yellow area kind of on the outside. So those are the more negative ends. In this case, we're comparing a hydrogen to a boron, and the hydrogen is actually more negative. It's important to point out that the hydrogens over here were positively charged because carbon was more negative, and here they're negatively charged because the boron's more positive. Okay, so now we're going to talk about ionic bonds. As I mentioned before, an ionic bond is a bond where your electrons are not shared. So one of those atoms is essentially stealing all of the electrons. So this means that our atoms have an extreme difference in electronegativity, those values where we have a difference of more than 1.7. The best example, of course, is sodium chloride, which has a sodium, which is very electropositive, and a chlorine, which is very electronegative. So sodium chloride really should not be drawn ever as a covalent bond. Don't do that. It should properly be drawn as a sodium plus and a Cl minus. The negative and the positive charges attract, so there is an interaction, but this is not a covalent bond or even a polar covalent bond. Polyatomic ions have some ionic character and some covalent character. So for example, sodium hydroxide on the left here has an oxygen-hydrogen bond that is covalent, a negative charge on the oxygen, and a positive charge on the sodium. So the sodium and the oxygen have the ionic bond, and the oxygen and the hydrogen have the covalent bond. We also have potassium methoxide here. So if you would see this drawn out, it's often drawn out as KOCH3. The potassium and the oxygen have an ionic bond, shown there, and the oxygen-carbon and the carbon-hydrogen bonds are all different types of covalent bonds, nonpolar covalent bonds for the carbon-hydrogen, and the oxygen-carbon bond would be polar covalent. Here's one more example. In this case, the positive charge is on the nitrogen, and that positive charge and the negative charge on the chlorine over here represent the ionic bond. And of course, we have lots of covalent bonds in the rest of this species. So you'll see that you can have a counter ion that is positively charged in the case of sodium hydroxide and potassium methoxide, or we can have a counter ion that's negatively charged in the case of this molecule on the right. That concludes electronegativity, polar bonds, and ionic bonds. In future lectures, we're going to talk about how these apply to reactivity of organic molecules.